I'm Edson, and um, the director of the RCSB Protein Data Bank, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all here today to the first of our IQB uh, seminars for the fall of, uh, of 2018. Uh, for those of you who have not picked up a 2019 What is a Protein calendar, I uh, commend it to you. Uh, and then if you want a little lit, light bedtime reading, there's a... Um, annual report from the most recent annual report from the Protein Data Bank, which uh, describes more of, uh, of what we're doing. So my objective today is to describe some of the work we've been doing to understand the impact of the Protein Data Bank on our understanding of uh, anti-cancer drug action and mechanisms of resistance. And I'll point out specifically how this inter intersects with the missions of both the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, uh, which is located over in New Brunswick next to the Robert Wood Johnson Hospital, and also the, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, so by way of, uh, of outline, I'm going to uh, tell you something about the, uh, the history of the, of the Protein Data Bank during the introduction, and then explain how this is a sustaining living uh, data resource uh, give you some uh, insights into how to, how to access data from the Protein Data Bank using our website, rcsp.org. And then I'll go through some examples of how we're intersecting with uh, the mission of the Cancer Institute of New Jersey and the mission of the, the National Cancer Institute. And, and I'll finish by showing you some uh, unpublished data uh, that uh, we've been uh, working up recently that, it, that documents the very significant effect that uh, academic structural biologists and the Protein Data Bank are having on uh, US FDA drug approvals. So let's start with the, the Protein Data Bank. This is the first open access digital data resource in all of biology. It was founded in 1971 with uh, seven X-ray structures of proteins and the inspiration for the launch of, uh, of the PDB is uh, shown in some of the structures on the right that should be familiar to you. So top left is myoglobin, the very first 3D structure to be determined by X-ray crystallography um, for a protein, followed uh, rapidly, of course, by uh, that of hemoglobin, which is a, a tetrameric assembly of, um, of polypeptide chains of the same fold. And then uh, two of the, uh, the early enzyme structures, lysozyme uh, being the first from the lab where I did my DPhil in Oxford, and then uh, ribonuclease S, which came from, um, uh, from Yale, from Fred Richards' lab. So it's grown uh, 20,000 fold in the last 47 years or so uh, to have uh, on the order of 145,000 structures in, in the PDB. It's the single global archive for experimental structures of proteins, uh, DNA, RNA. And since 2003, it's been managed by the Worldwide Protein Data Bank Partnership, which is a collaboration involving the US Europe, uh, Japan, and uh, Biomag ResBank, uh, which is located in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, the Protein Data Bank came to Rutgers in 1999 from uh, the Brookhaven National Lab uh, under the leadership of uh, Helen Berman, who's in the audience. Um, and uh, it was Helen and her vision for the, uh, for the PDB archive and for the RCSB PDB that uh, uh, it explains why we, we are where we are today, why we have a relational uh, database that allows us to uh, understand a great deal more about structures than we could ever do from simple flat files, which was the condition of the, uh, the archive when it was transferred from Brookhaven. So we support uh, research worldwide, uh, but particularly in the US with the rcsb.org website. We have an outreach and education website that uh, includes um, lots of, uh, of fun, fun exercises in addition to some quite serious uh, information about uh, global health and the like. Uh, we are jointly funded by the uh, NSF, uh, NCI, NIGMS, and the Department of Energy. Uh, and I'm uh, very pleased to report that we recently have renewed the funding uh, for another five years, running from the beginning of 2019 to the end of 2023, and have secured a, uh, a significant um, increase in funding, uh, which is the first time for more than a decade. This was a, a huge team effort, uh, and uh, Everybody who is part of the RCSB PDB, whether in the, they're in the room or not, or, or in, uh, in 
uh, in uh, in San Diego uh, played a role in in bringing this to to a successful conclusion. The uh, so um, I'll explain why we uh, why we did well in the uh, in the renewal process and the impact that we're having on cancer. So we are supporting research and education uh, across the sciences, fundamental biology, biomedicine, and energy. We're in collecting data from all over the world. The current holdings of the PDB have a, an estimated replacement cost on the order of $14 billion. These data are feeding into both the RCSB PDB website and the, uh, the PDB 101 website. And uh, we're supporting uh, biologists, drug hunters, uh, educators, chemists, and the private sector with, uh, with these data. They can be used by anybody anywhere in the world without any restrictions on, on how the data are used and what the data are used for. We recently reorganized as part of the renewal process, the RCSB PDB activities into four services that take global data and turn it into global knowledge. The deposition and biocuration services are led by Jasmine Young, uh, who is probably in the audience somewhere, um, uh, perhaps not, uh, perhaps doing things more useful. And um, she oversees uh, the, uh, the data processing and validation of new structures that are coming from uh, the Americas and from Oceania. Our European partners handle Europe and Africa and our Japanese partners handle Asia. Uh, all of those data end up in, uh, in this green uh, archive uh, symbol here. And uh, then um, three additional services in the, uh, in the RCSB are responsible for managing the archive and uh, ensuring global access to the data, ensuring that the data can be uh, explored uh, using uh, either of the two websites, the rcsb.org or the PDB 101 website and making data available for, for download uh, by, uh, by people around the world. The archive management and access services are, are run by John Westbrook here in uh, Rutgers. Data exploration services are run by Cole Christie, who's based in uh, California. And then the outreach and education services are, are run by uh, Christine Zardecki, who's the, uh, the deputy director. Uh, we are serving up data from the archive directly to more than 400 uh, different scientific resources. Uh, we are serving uh, more than a million uh, unique users uh, on an annual basis worldwide. Uh, Google tells me that uh, thinks the number of unique users is around 3 million, but um, it's, hard to, it's hard to ascertain the accuracy of that. So we simply say more than a million. And the usage of the PDB 101 website is also very substantial. So when you come to rcspdb.org RCSPD, uh, and access uh, PDB data, you can get um, the uh, atomic coordinates of the structure, uh, access to the experimental data, all the information about the ligands that may be uh, bound to the, uh, the structure, metadata pertaining to organism uh, of origin, the sequence of the protein, the, the provenance of the sample, et cetera. And then importantly, these static data, uh, these data that are provided to us by uh, approximately 30,000 depositors worldwide uh, are then integrated with approximately 40 external data resources that provide functional annotations. And these are updated every week. So the part of the science that's dynamic, that's undergoing uh, change uh, with the emergence of new information is, uh, is integrated and, uh, and updated on a weekly basis uh, by the, uh, the archive management and data access team. You can uh, visualize uh, sequences and structures. You could look at, at similarity. And the point that I want to make here is that this goes well beyond the, what you can learn from the original publication describing the structure, because that is static. Uh, that, is, uh, that is not being updated as new functional information might come available for that protein. Uh, and, uh, and by coming to RCSB PDB, you can overcome that limitation of the, uh, the original primary publication. The most important part of the mission of the Cancer Institute of New Jersey and the mission of the NCI are new anti-cancer drugs. And um, in, a, in a recent analysis that uh, we performed here uh, at, uh, at Rutgers, uh, it's clear that we're having a very significant effect on um, 
uh, anti-neoplastic drug approvals. Uh, so between 2010 and 2016, the US FDA approved 59 new anti-cancer drugs. It's estimated that between 2000 and 2016, 75 billion of NIH funding was spent on the pre-competitive research that provided the basis for companies making investments in drug discovery for, uh, for the target proteins. When we look inside the PDB, we see that there are nearly 1,300 target structures, uh, targets of most of, uh, in fact, 55 of these 59 uh, new, uh, new drugs that were approved by the US FDA, and there are three, three such examples uh, shown here. Um, so, you can, um, so you can see that uh, in terms of the, uh, the impact on the pre-competitive research, the research necessary to qualify a target for, uh, for entry into a drug discovery program, the PDB is having a significant impact in the anti-cancer arena. Uh, for reference, um, total funding of the PDB from between 2000 and 2016 uh, was one one thousandth of what was spent on the on the pre-competitive research. So, 0.1 uh, percent. Precision medicine is uh, is is a very significant topic and area of interest at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and in fact across all of the NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers in the U.S. And the example that I'm going to talk about is that of um, of the BRAF uh, protein kinase. In 50% of patients with late stage uh, melanoma, meaning metastatic melanoma. Uh, there's an activating mutation in the, uh, in the BRAF gene that gives rise to um, a change at the level of the protein at, code, at codon number 600, changing a valine into a glutamic acid. Uh, this dysregulated uh, enzyme is a significant driver for growth uh, for these, uh, these cancers, as you can see uh, on, the, on the right. Uh, when we compare the uh, the v six hundred e form to uh, to wild type, um, a company named Plexicon uh, operating out on the west coast in the Bay Area decided to target that enzyme uh, with a structure based drug discovery approach and they were able um, in ultimately in partnership with Roche um, to uh, get a drug called Vemurafenib approved by the US FDA, uh, complete with a companion diagnostic to ensure that only those patients who actually have the mutation in their tumors uh, receive the drug. Because the other 50% of the patients will get no benefit and may even be harmed by the drug. So you need to ensure that that, uh, that does not happen. If you are interested in looking at BRAF structures in the PDB, you can go to our, our homepage, homepage and type BRAF in the, uh, in the search box, and this will bring up a, a menu with a variety of choices that you can, uh, uh, you can act on, uh, and ultimately you will be able to get to a structure such as the one I'm depicting here. This is the, this is the 3D structure deposited to the PDB by Plexicon um, of the mutant form of the enzyme bound to the, the inhibitor that has now, now been approved uh, by the US FDA as Vemurafenib. You can also get access on this same structure summary page to the primary literature, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the primary citation, uh, which um, appeared in Nature in, in 2010. Uh, and um, by moving to the uh, the protein feature view of the uh, function within the structure summary page, you can actually look at the relationship between the linear sequence, the secondary structure, and a variety of different annotations. And these are the things that are being updated on a weekly basis. So, um, for example, the, the location of the V600E mutation falls here, and uh, it's, uh, it's identified on a line, maybe hard to see, entitled variation. Uh, we also have sites for uh, phosphorylation, uh, identification of sites in, in, the, in the protein that get phosphorylated. Uh, there are a variety of, uh, of other um, lines in this uh, protein feature view that uh, look at secondary structure, uh, look at the uh, uh, hyd hydrophobicity, and also show you the, the context of, of this particular structure in, the, in terms of the entire uh, length of the polypeptide chain. So you can see that this portion of the, the polypeptide chain has got uh, three structures in the PDB. 
portion over here has two and another portion over here also also has two. So there's some dark matter in, in the in the protein structure universe to be sure where we may not uh, may not have structures. We know this is the intracellular portion of the uh, protein that is catalytically active in terms of uh, acting as a protein kinase, and it's the one that gets dysregulated by the V600E mutation. Uh, there's also small molecule data in the, in the, available in, on the structure summary page, so uh, information about the small molecule vemurafenib, including its chemical structure, its full, full name, uh, formula, et cetera, and information drawn from external sources. Again, these are data that are being up, up, uh, updated continuously. Uh, through the uh, the weekly update process for uh, enzyme inhibition data coming from uh, binding DB and also PDB bind, uh, two uh, two resources that interoperate with uh, with the rcsp.org website. We've recently upgraded the uh, 3D structure visualization tools uh, on the uh, the structure summary page using an NGL viewer. This is a, a so-called web native viewer that works on any device with any browser, and it allows you to manipulate, rotate, etc., cetera, uh, structures that um, uh, can be displayed uh, in uh, at, at lightning speed, even on a, a, a smartphone or a, or a tablet. You can download the images and use them in publications. And there's also the ability to display additional information pertaining to electron density maps and the validation of the uh, the 3D structure. So one of the important functions that the deposition uh, and biocuration team uh, fulfills within the RCSB PDB is validation of the, the incoming structures, both in terms of our knowledge of protein um, features uh, and the geometry of the polypeptide chain, and in terms of the match between the experimental data and the interpretation of the experimental data by the depositors. There's a formal validation report, which is available for every, every structure in the PDB. These are recomputed periodically because the, the quality of structures in the PDB are continually improving. And these structures are rated against the average quality in, uh, in the archive. And this is most easily seen in terms of uh, these sliders, which, give in, which provide insight into how good this particular structure is from uh, Plexicon versus other structures in the archive. And you see it's sort of in the lower half, it's in the bottom 50% in terms of, of quality. Uh, these frequently protein crystals are very hard to grow and this, this, uh, and this is often the best one can do. Uh, but it's important for you as consumers of this information to know which parts of the structure are reliable, which are not, and which, which structures are completely unreliable or within a particular group of structures of the same polypeptide chain. What is the one with the best uh, uh, 3D, uh, 3D quality? The experimental data are available for experts in the field to actually do make their own analysis of, of structure quality. Uh, and we've, we've built into the NGL viewer some uh, display tools, uh, the most important of which is actually being able to display the, elect the difference electron density for the, uh, the ligand in the uh, bound to the, uh, uh, the protein. So this is um, the same 3D structure of the vemurafenib bound to the mutant uh, BRAF. And you can see uh, here in this uh, inset the... Uh, Calculated electron density map. This is the difference between the observed data and the calculated data, assuming that uh, that the, uh, the that the atomic coordinates have had the three D structure of the ligand stripped out. So this is a relatively unbiased view of the information that went into determining uh, how the ligand was positioned. And you can see that there's a good correspondence between the um, uh, the electron density and the the way in which the scientists at Plexicon, who are high quality crystallographers, I should add, um, fit the uh, the ligand into the electron density. There's also information about the ligand quality itself in terms of outliers, bond lengths, bond angles, and um, a uh, real space correlation between the chemical structure and the electron density. Uh, described in terms both of a correlation coefficient and a real space uh, R factor. So all of this is now served up on the website uh, and made, a, made available to you as you, as you consume the information and, um, and 
make determinations about what to trust, where the structure may not provide all the information necessary to understand the system, where there's an opportunity to actually design a new experiment and, uh, and test a new hypothesis. RAS is of, uh, of great uh, significance in the mission of the NCI. The RAS genes are mutated in approximately a third of all human cancers. And uh, we are supporting the RAS initiative, the, the, the national RAS, RAS initiative, with an extensive data ecosystem of, of RAS and RAS-related structures. One is uh, depicted here um, of, of a, a covalently acting inhibitor that uh, uh, attaches to a sulfhydryl in, the, in a cysteine, in free sulfhydryl in a cysteine uh, in, the, in the RAS structure. Um, and of course, I, I should have mentioned earlier that every structure in the PDB has a four letter identifier associated with it. Um, in this particular case, it's for uh, mother 2-2. Two, two. Um, there are other uh, interesting structures that uh, have been um, uh, put in, in the PDB over, over the years that uh, are motivating different approaches to RAS drug discovery. Uh, this is um, a 3D structure of the of the uh, the RAS SOS complex. Uh, SOS is sub, son of sevenless. It's uh, an exchange factor, which promotes the uh, the exchange of the uh, the ligand uh, when the GTP is uh, uh, to promotes extrusion of the GTP and uh, and binding of a new uh, a new GTP. Uh, in this particular case, the 3D structure was used as a uh, means of screening for fragments that might stabilize the 3D structure of the uh, quaternary structure of the RAS SOS complex. If you stop RAS from, if you stop SOS from disengaging RAS, you can shut down RAS. Uh, we, we did this, uh, we did similar experiments many years ago using the same strategy at SGX Pharmaceuticals where I was uh, in San Diego for many years, and uh, and we showed uh, with uh, one of the um, uh, one of the leads that we uh, we began optimizing it with this project that you could actually get uh, you could stop uh, RAS dependent cell proliferation by stabilizing this uh, the 3D structure of this complex and work along these lines is is uh, going on at various companies and also in in academe. Uh, there are uh, approximately 600 PDB structures of um, uh, RAS proteins and signaling proteins that are downstream of RAS. This is what I mean about the, uh, the structure ecosystem that uh, allows people to understand the target biology and identify potential strategies for, uh, for intervening. Uh, another important uh, contribution that the NCI is making nationally is to establish a genomic data co commons that stores information about point mutants found in, uh, in human cancers uh, that may, may be relevant for understanding uh, mechanism of, uh, of, trans of cell transformation and uh, providing entry points for, uh, for discovery. So uh, this is work that uh, we did in collaboration with Dr. Stephen Zhang, who's sitting right in front of me, um, on, on mTOR drug resistance. Stephen and his, his colleagues at, at CINJ did a saturation mutagenesis experiment looking for mutational hotspots that would lead to drug resistance uh, for uh, anti-mTOR agents. And to their surprise, to our surprise, it was not the, the usual gatekeeper residue, uh, which is an isoleucine at position 2237, uh, color-coded here in purple, but a nearby leucine that uh, at position 2185 that proved to be the hotspot. If you change that uh, uh, leucine to an alanine, uh, the protein still works as, as, a, as an enzyme, as a protein kinase, and uh, you'll be able to appreciate why in a moment, uh, but it confers uh, resistance to, uh, to a whole host of anti-mTOR agents. Uh, but interestingly, it's sensitive to others. So uh, Stephen uh, asked uh, Brenda Vallett and I to uh, to look into this in 3D and and come up with some uh, some insights. So initially, so here's a, an inset view of the uh, the structure of um, of the wild type enzyme with uh, with an ATP analog. Um, Here's a model of the, uh, the structure of the, uh, the alanine mutation. And in this inset, you can see that it's perhaps not surprising that this uh, mutant enzyme still works as a protein kinase. The binding of, um, 
of ATP will not be perturbed by the uh, by the withdrawal of significantly perturbed by the withdrawal of, of the leucine. If one um, then looks at the structure of um, uh, of RAS with um, taurin two bound, one of the uh, one of one of the the anti mTOR agents, one I think can immediately appreciate why looking at this inset and then at this inset, why this uh, why the this L two one eighty five A version of the protein is still sensitive to uh, to torrent 2 despite the fact that there's resistance to uh, to other agents so when identifying this particular point mutant in a patient one would be directed to uh, the use of drugs for which um, uh, sensitivity is uh, is preserved uh, and uh, and uh, uh, persuaded against the use of uh, of agents like uh, pp242 or sepanasertib I want to talk briefly about immunotherapy. Anybody who watches TV uh, is seeing ads from CINJ, ads from the, from, uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center about the importance of, of immunotherapy. Uh, I, I submit to you that our understanding of T-cell biology uh, benefited enormously from uh, 3D structure information and its availability in the, in the public domain beginning with this very first structure of the major histocompatibility complex determined in Don Wiley's lab uh, at uh, Harvard. Since the deposition of, uh, of that structure back in 1987, more than 750 structures have been put into the PDB that together help explain how, how T cells function. So after the, uh, uh, this, this first molecule was uh, deposited, the first structure was deposited to the PDB of the protein that's responsible for antigen presentation to T cells. It, it sits on the surface of the antigen presenting cell. Don Wiley and his team uh, produced another structure with a linear peptide antigen bound in this groove on the surface, on the upper surface of the major histocompatibility complex. And then others went on uh, to uh, study even higher order structures in which the T cell receptor and its interactions with the antigen MHC complex were, were visualized in three dimensions, uh, completing the connection to the T cell. And it's this interaction which is responsible for educating the T cell uh, about the linear uh, peptides that are present in the proteome of the antigen presenting cell. And the T cell has memory, so the T cell knows whether or not that particular uh, antigen is self or non-self and then um, is able to make a decision about whether or not to kill the antigen presenting cell. Uh, there's more to it than this, of course, because there always is in biology. There's a multi-signal hypothesis, in fact, as to uh, how T cell uh, responses to antigen presentation uh, occur. Um, if um, the antigen presenting cell has uh, B7 uh, on it protruding from its surface and is in, able to engage CD28, on the surface of the, uh, on the, of the T cell, the, uh, the, the response of the T cell is upregulated. Um, and this is something that you may want in some cases, and of course, in other, case, in other situations, you may not. In the context of autoimmune disease, this particular interaction, uh, which has been visualized crystallographically, it may not be something that you want. Tumor cells uh, present antigens, of course, and one of the strategies that tumor cells have worked out uh, is um, uh, through evolution um, uh, is that if they present um, PDL1 on the surface on, of, on, on the cell surface, it will engage the PD1, the programmed uh, death uh, receptor protein, on the surface of the T cell, and that will downregulate the activity of the T cell. So tumors that have PDL1 or PDL2 on their surfaces tend to downregulate the immune response to the tumor. There's a theory of, uh, of oncogenesis that mutations are arising spontaneously in our cells all the time. Uh, and most of the time, the immune system is capable of, of deciding that that cell is abnormal and kill the cell before it becomes a frank tumor. Uh, when, the immune, when that immune surveillance fails, uh, you, um, you are going to have uh, proliferation of, of the tumor, and that proliferation will be enhanced if 
there's an, an interaction between PDL1 and PD1 on the surface of, of the T cell. Again, all of the interactions I'm showing you here have been visualized crystal, crystallographically, and they can all be seen uh, in, uh, in the protein data bank. So this next structure that I'm going to show you spinning is the interaction between uh, the extracellular portion of PDL1 uh, in green and the extracellular portion of uh, PD1 shown here in red. And there are more than 30 structures that explain uh, how this interaction occurs involving either uh, PDL1 or, uh, or, or PDL2, the, the alternative uh, that for which the, um, uh, the, the tumor can, uh, can display uh, and uh, downregulate the T cell. This knowledge led to the hypothesis that if you blocked this interaction, you could actually restore the immune, some, some, perhaps not all, but some of the immune surveillance against tumors in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a patient and um, uh, promote uh, killing of the tumor by, the, by the, the patient's own immune system. And that, uh, that, um, that hypothesis proved to be correct. And it is the basis of this immune checkpoint blockade therapy that, uh, that one hears about um, you know, and, and reads about, one hears about on the TV, reads about on the web. The, uh, so the strategy is to, was uh, pursued independently at uh, BMS, who've been, who are the pioneers in this, Bristol-Myers Squibb, just literally 10, 15 miles that way. Uh, and uh, fast followers were Merck, about 10, 15 miles that way. Um, and they, they realized that if they could uh, generate a monoclonal antibody to uh, PD-1, uh, and here's a, a structure of an FAB fragment, recognizing uh, PD-1 and preventing the binding, the engagement of, uh, of PD-L1, that you might be able to turn the immune system back on. And this is the explanation for uh, the fact that Jimmy Carter did not die after he went to uh, visit his congregation uh, and explained to them that he had end-stage metastatic uh, melanoma. It had already uh, gone to his brain. And that the oncologist at Emory University at the medical school there had run out of options and that he was going to go into hospice care. Uh, little did he know that the uh, efforts that they were making on his behalf by giving him the Merck drug, Keytruda, uh, have actually saved his life. Uh, so some months later, he went back to the church and said, well, it looks like I'm not going to die. Uh, he is one of about a third of patients with melanoma who receive either of the, either of the antibodies, either the, uh, the antibody from uh, BMS or the antibody from Merck. They bind to slightly different regions on the surface, but they do the same thing. About a third of those patients have either a long-term remission or a cure. These observations in the clinic um, explained um, urban legends that I heard as a, me a medical student when I was at Harvard. Uh, faculty members would tell us that there were case reports in the literature of a patient with widely metastatic cancer who went, um, uh, was uh, failing therapy and suddenly um, was uh, the victim of, of a severe bacterial infection, a septicemia. Uh, so that means uh, bacteria growing in the blood. Uh, and that's a, th these are life-threatening infections. They require ant intravenous antibiotics. Um, they're they can be particularly problematic today, of course, because of anti antibiotic resistance, about which I talked 10 days ago uh, in this room. And in some rare cases, when the patients were successfully treated with antibiotics, the tumors began to melt away. The patient recovered from the infection and the tumor began to disappear from the body and the, the patients were either cured or they had a long-term remission. And nobody ever understood that. And I think we now understand that what happened in that setting was that the immune system was so revved up when, uh, when the, uh, the infection was, uh, was uh, in, in full force that the immune system began to attack the cancer because it re-recognized it, re it as non-self. Uh, I don't want to leave you with the impression that these are miracle drugs. They only work in about a third of the cases and only in some tumors. And in some cases, the patient may get benefit from the reactivation of the immune system in terms of going into remission, 
and then they have a new problem. It, there, there are now case reports that describe the acute onset of uh, type 1 diabetes in patients who've received these antibodies. So what has happened in those cases, unfortunately, is the immune system's killed the cancer, but it's also wiped out the pancreatic beta cells, and the patients have type 1 diabetes, similar to what you see in children who undergo uh, pancreatic beta cell destruction, destruction and develop a type 1, uh, uh, type 1 diabetes and, and become insulin dependent. So these are not... Uh, uh, these are not miracle drugs by any means, and, and every drug, of course, is a double-edged sword. So uh, the key to cancer, of course, is uh, ultimately the key to controlling cancer is prevention. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, structural insights we have in, into how uh, cervical cancer can be prevented with, uh, with, uh, through vaccination. Uh, the, the human papillomavirus uh, a, a cryo-EM structure depicted here uh, has um, uh, a, a, a major capsid protein called L1, and there's a limited number of serotypes of uh, the uh, HPVs that actually go on to cause uh, cervical cancer. Other serotypes cause genital warts and other cancers, and, and other HPVs are completely benign. So uh, a group at the NCI uh, developed a technology using uh, in engineering of the L1 proteins to create virus-like particles. So these are hollow spheres of, made up of uh, the L1 protein uh, that um, elicit a, uh, an immune response which is sufficient to kill the, uh, uh, to, to kill the, the, uh, the virus. And here is the 3D structure of one of these virus-like particles decorated with um, the V5, FABs of the V5 antibody, and you can see the, uh, the antibody FABs uh, covering much of the, uh, the 3D structure of the, uh, the virus-like particle. Uh, there are now a number of different uh, products on the market, bivalent, tetravalent, and uh, nonavalent um, uh, HPV vaccines that, uh, that are, uh, are in clinical use. And um, when, uh, when, proper, when administered at the right time, early in the, uh, the life of, uh, you know, early in the, uh, the teen years, with appropriate follow-up in terms of um, revaccination, which is required for full, uh, for full protection, you can, uh, you can eliminate uh, uh, cervical cancer in, uh, in young women, and you can eliminate uh, genital warts, et cetera, in, uh, in young men. Uh, the other thing that the PDB has allowed us to do, of course, is to understand the mechanisms by which the human papillomavirus has its uh, oncogenic effects. And um, uh, there are two uh, early viral proteins, E6 and E7, encoded by the, the genome that are known to be uh, oncogenes. Uh, E6, depicted here in, um, in pink, uh, binds to the uh, P53 tumor suppressor protein and recruits it to a ubiquitin ligase where it gets degraded. Uh, and there are more than 100 structures that actually in the PDB that explain this, this process. Uh, E7 uh, works through a different mechanism. It, in, it inactivates uh, the RB retinoblastoma protein, and there are north of 140 PDB structures that help explain uh, this particular uh, mechanism of, of oncogenesis. So before I close, uh, I, I want to, uh, I just want to emphasize the, the impact that the PDB is having broadly on drug discovery uh, and, and development. Uh, again, these are data that are unpublished that uh, we've um, recently generated uh, here at Rutgers. Um, so in addition to analyzing those new anti-cancer drugs that were approved between 2010 and 2016 by the US FDA, um, we looked at all 210 new drugs that were approved in that era. And 174 of these new drugs have 3D structures in the PDB, either of the target or the target with bound to other proteins or the target bound to the drug in some cases. And for the protein drugs, for the new, for the monoclonal antibodies, et cetera, there are also 3D structures in the PDB of the protein drugs themselves. So uh, the, the bulk of these PDB structures and the, and the papers describing the structure determinations 
were put into the public domain more than a decade before the drugs were approved. So this tells you that the data were there for people who were studying the target biology and building the, uh, the case that a particular protein represented a viable drug target, uh, inducing, the, um, uh, in, inducing uh, one or more private companies to actually invest in drug discovery activities. It's estimated by, uh, by a team uh, clear, that published in uh, this paper in PNAS uh, earlier this year, Cleary et al., that north of $100 billion was spent on pre-competitive research on, these, on the targets of these 210 new drugs um, between the year 2000 and the year and, and, uh, 2016. Uh, they estimated that this this corresponded to 20% of NIH spending in that in that 16 17 year period, uh, and um, they also looked at uh, as we did at the the literature describing the targets for these 210 drugs. There are more than two million papers published in the literature on the targets of these 210 drugs. Virtually all of them basic pre-competitive work with nothing to do with drug discovery. It's all to do about understanding the target biology. And about 10% of those papers have actually cited the PDB structure in, um, uh, of uh, one or more of the PDB structures of the target. So it's clear that, that, the, uh, that the structure data that's in the PDB is having an impact on the pre-competitive research that's ultimately allowing an argument to be made within a company. We should invest in um, in the uh, in the target and trying to find a new a new medical entity, a new drug, NME or new drug that um, uh, will be uh, will be will be effective in in a particular uh, disease. Can anybody among the students give me a guess as to how much the companies spent getting these two hundred and ten drugs to the market? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Do you think it was north? How many people think it was north of 100 billion? How many think it was more north of 300 billion? How many think it was north of 600 billion? I know the data. <laughs> so more than 700 billion was spent on getting these 210 drugs to the market. 100 billion was spent by the NIH alone, your tax dollars at work, laying the groundwork for a $600 billion investment by the companies. This is not counting, of course, all the other research that was going on around the world that was funded by um, other agencies, by agencies other than NIH. In aggregate, that was probably at least 50 billion. So, so it's uh, north of three quarters of a trillion dollars probably was spent getting these 210 drugs to market. Drug companies will only invest 2.7 billion to get a drug to market if they have confidence in the biology of the target. Even with all the pre-competitive pre research, all the data that's in the public domain, it's, it's the case that across the industry, a third of drug discovery and development projects fail because the target biology is not adequately understood. And what I mean by that is you, you, you either have a, a, a protein drug or a small molecule that blocks the action of the target, you put it into the patient, and it doesn't address the clinical need that the patient has. That happens in a third of cases. The other third of cases fail because of uh, tox, toxicity, either at the level of the animal or at the level of the patient. And the final one third of failures in quotation marks in the drug industry are the result uh, either of, or, or the fault, if you will, either of the lawyers or the business people, meaning there was something wrong with the patent situation and the company pulled back, or their earlier estimates regarding the size of the market were uh, reassessed and a decision was made to stop the project because they didn't believe it was going to be financially worthwhile. And that might be because another drug had come along from another company. and They decided, okay, we, we can't compete with that. Let's just stop. Uh, there is certainly a benefit in the industry to having the first, to be the first on the market with a new type of drug. 
but that isn't always the best seller for a particular class of drugs. Uh, how many people in the take a statin? How many people? Some of you, yeah, take a statin. Um, Lipitor, the best-selling statin in the world, it was number three to the market. It's not. It's it's ultimately it's best to be best. It's not. It's not always best to be first. Uh, so the first in class, Mevacor, came from Merck, just up the road, um, was uh, was a big seller, but it was ultimately supplanted by uh, by Lipitor because uh, of the uh, superior outcomes uh, for patients taking Lipitor versus uh, versus those uh, taking the other statins. The geniuses down at Bristol Myers Squibb ran a head-to-head -head trial between their statin and Lipitor. And the results were dismal, and essentially it killed the entire market for the uh, for the Bristol Myers Squibb drug. I was on the BMS drug at the time. As soon as I read the data, spoke to my clinician and said, "I want to be put on Lipitor. I don't want to be on the BMS drug anymore. The outcomes are better with Lipitor." Um, so that would be a post-approval failure on the part of the uh, the business people. Um, so uh, with that, I want, to, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to acknowledge that everything that's going on in the Protein Data Bank is an enormous team effort. You see the cast of characters here. Some of you them you will recognize from the building. Others are based out in, uh, in San Diego uh, and one of them, uh, one of them in, uh, in Denver. Uh, none of this would be possible, of course, without the generosity of the American taxpayer and funding from NSF uh, NCI, NIGMS, and the Department of Energy. And uh, none of this would be possible, of course, without the, uh, the excellent facilities that Rutgers and UCSD provide uh, to us. I also want, want to acknowledge the contributions that our, our global partners make in the Worldwide Protein Data Bank. Um, the, uh, this, this, this step, the formation of this group was the brainchild of uh, Helen Berman. And it has ensured sustainability of the PDB archive, and it has avoided the fate that befell the genome sequence archives worldwide in that it avoided fragmentation. There is a single global archive for protein structures, one, one place where the data are, uh, are um, you know, one archive, multiple copies securely held around the world to ensure that uh, we never lose those data. Um, and the the opportunity using the rcsb.org website to uh, to actually learn a lot more about a lot more than just the uh, uh, the structures the, themselves uh, with the integration of the data that we do uh, on a weekly basis. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and um, I'm looking forward to my lunch with the students. So we have some. Traveling mics, Stephen. Would you like to ask the first question? Uh, okay. uh, beautiful talk and uh, congratulations on the uh, PDB funding renewal. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, as you alluded uh, in the beginning of the talk, you know the three-dimensional display of protein structures are very important to understand oncogenic mutations. You know, so now we can easily get access in a two-dimensional terms of linear sequence right. where the spectral mutations are. Do we have the capacity to look at the whole spectrum of mutations on the 3D, 3D structure? With the, the, with the work that's going on in San Diego right now with the NGL viewer, that, that functionality will soon be available. I'm, I'm optimistic it might be available next year, but, uh, but soon. Um, I, I won't commit to a date, but uh, but certainly um, the the team is working very hard towards that uh, that that goal, so that it would be possible in a tumor board, for example, to look at some at a mutate the consequences of a mutation in 3D, either because that mutation, a structure bearing that mutation, is in the PDB archive, uh, as is is the is the case for. Uh, for, for some systems or uh, through making a model as we were able to do in, in collaboration with you. <clears throat> Very interesting work. Um, I, I have a, one common question. 
about the impact of the PDB database. So you, you're talking about money, 100 million spent by the NIH. 100 billion. Uh, billion, sorry, 100 billion. Yeah, right. you know, it's just a few zeros. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. And, the, and then uh, 600 billion from the industry. Yeah. And how many people are taking the scripts for those? Like, essentially, it's the people that matters in the end. The money is nice, but how many people are being helped by those drugs? And how much is it bringing back to the industry and everybody? So, in, in benefits. So, I don't know how many people would be taking those 210 drugs. Well, I, um, so all of those 210 drugs are on the market. We haven't gone through and done uh, an analysis of annual sales. Um, that, that would be an interesting exercise to do. And if there's a student from the business school or an economist in the room who would be interested in tackling that project, I, I think it would be great. That would be a great project to do. And it's essentially, it's the number of scripts that are being done that are like the sale is good, but it's again, well, you, it's can, how many you can extrapolate from average pricing in various geographies uh, uh, what, the, uh, what, what the utilization of those agents are, are, are going to be. Um, the uh, some of, I can tell you that some of the drugs in that 200, 2010 to 2016 uh, cohort, approved cohort, included the agents that are curing people of hepatitis C virus infection. I mean, these, these are life, th these are not nice to have. These are life transforming agents. Uh, there are, uh, as I said, the, the, those, those two antibodies that I talked about from, uh, from Merck and BMS, uh, both of those were approved in that era. Those are both uh, selling north of a billion dollars a year. Um, and as I was describing, you've got people like Jimmy Carter and a lot of people who aren't famous walking around living productive, healthy, happy lives as a direct consequence of, of that intervention. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, I worked in, in I'm, I'm not ashamed of the fact I worked in industry for a decade. Um, I know some people think it puts a stain <laughs> on a person, and I know some people think that people who come from industry smell, but, um, uh, and, and I know that some people think, uh, as is commonly held at the NIH, that the reason that drugs are difficult and time-consuming to discover and develop and expensive to discover and develop is because people who work in industry are corrupt and second-rate. And I can assure you, I can assure you that is not the case. People I worked with at SGX Pharmaceuticals and at Lilly and various other companies over the years are uh, are very smart. It's just very hard, uh, and it really uh, are there ways to do it better and faster? Absolutely, and and the people at Plexicon proved that they had. You know, a deep molecular insight into the target. They decided that what they would do was tailor a drug to that 50% of patients with, uh, the, with late stage metastatic melanoma that had that, uh, uh, had that uh, mutation on board. The drug was able to get a very rapid approval because they could do a focused clinical trial. They only took patients who had the, uh, the mutation, high likelihood of a, of, of a clinical benefit, and, uh, and, 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 a, and a much cheaper path ultimately to, uh, to an approval than uh, uh, a situation where you have, to, you have to do a massive trial and you have to do a trial versus uh, standard of care. There was no standard of care in melanoma, at that, in late stage melanoma at that point when people were going to hospice. Uh, they, um, and, and Carter had ultimately failed that drug, mm -hmm. which is why he went on to, uh, to Keytruda, of course. Uh, he, um, so um, I'm not sure where you're going with this business about scripts. No, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying how, ma how many people are being helped by the work and the investment. Mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. all I'm going. Well, it's to say. it's certainly in the millions. Right. Certainly. And and if you think so, um, there are um, the very first structure of insulin came into the PDB uh, after it was determined in Oxford in 1971 by uh, Dorothy Hodgkin who also determined the structure of penicillin and, and set the stage for all the MedChem that went on with, uh, with that. Um, that structure is the, was fundamental to the protein engineering that was done in the companies to create very long-acting forms of insulin that provide 24-hour coverage, 
uh, and very, very short acting forms of insulin that are used um, at the time of meals, which has completely transformed the way patients can manage their blood sugar. Uh, much in a, these, 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 new, these new insulins are much better than the, um, the older formulations of the insulin that was being purified from a, the pancreas of a cow or the pancreas of a pig or the recombinant, the initial recombinant human insulins uh, that, uh, that became available uh, subsequently. Now everybody is taking human insulin. There's no market for pig and uh, cow insulin anymore. And uh, if you have good insurance, you should be on these new designer insulins because they just give much better control of blood sugar. Thank you. Please, yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the, the CNJ uh, intersection with the CNJ initiative for the RAS, mm -hmm. and uh, you share this with the uh, G12C, right? I think that the most common, the more common one is the G12D. That's more difficult, is it? Well, I think the advantage of that particular mutant form. I, let me go back to the, the. See if I can get out of this. Hang on, and go back to that slide. Uh, I think the advantage of that particular mutant form of RAS for a chemist is, there we go, is that, sorry, let me get rid of this first and then we'll go back. Um, yeah, it is this slide. So, uh, so when you, sorry, uh, when you have, when you have um, a glycine to cysteine mutation at this position, a covalently acting drug, an irreversible drug will, is an option because you have the sulfhydryl. So that's why people uh, went after this, this particular uh, chemistry uh, for which we uh, we have a 3D structure. You're absolutely right that this is not the most common mutation that occurs in RAS at that at that position. Uh, the beauty of this approach, sorry, um, the beauty of this approach, uh, the stabilizing the RAS sauce complex is that it's agnostic to the mutation. It's agnostic to the upregulating mutation of um, uh, RAS. Because what you're trying to do is to, the target is this protein complex that you're trying to stabilize to prevent the exchange, prevent the extrusion of GDP, the rebinding of GTP, and then the, the cycle, the, the RAS dependent uh, cycle that leads to proliferation of the tumor cell. So this, in principle, this is a more general approach, but there's not yet an approved, an approved drug uh, for this. And RAS has been one of those targets in which the industry has literally spent trillions of dollars and has nothing to show for it. So I thank you again for coming. Before you go, I want to remind you that on the 3rd of October uh, in cabin room 10, uh, Professor William Jorgensen of Yale University will be talking about computer-aided discovery of enzyme inhibitors, another application of the Protein Data Bank, and then um, we will resume the, uh, the IQB seminars with uh, Professor David Case, uh, who is going to speak on the 10th of October and um, describe what we can learn from MD simulations of biomolecular crystals. So more PDB. Thanks very much. <laughs>